Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed our list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of the viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. This news article is with reference to the recent release of Draft Unmanned Aircraft System Rules 2020. Ministry of Civil Aviation has published the draft rules on June 2nd, which deals with importing, manufacturing and owning drones as well as drone ports or airports for drones. The ministry has invited comments from stakeholders within 30 days, following which the rules are to be finalized. In this context, let us see some key provisions in the draft rules. See, at present, drones are used for surveillance, photography, and in the recent times, we could also see they being used to fight the locust invasion through disinfection. So far, there were no specific rules for unmanned aircraft system, and they were actually covered by a section of the Aircraft Act of 1934. But now, the entire spectrum of drones is to be covered with the proposed new rules, which cover from manufacture of drones to the usage of drones. In this, when we say unmanned aircraft, which is intended to operate with no pilot on board, and when you say unmanned aircraft system, it refers to an unmanned aircraft and its associated elements that are operated with no pilot on board. The new draft rules stipulate who all can manufacture, import and operate drones and where all they can be flown and under what conditions. And drone ports or drone corridors may be established in permitted areas. Rule 5 states that each drone importer, manufacturer, trader, owner and operator will need to take approval from the Director General of Civil Aviation. An authorized unmanned aircraft system importer or manufacturer must not sell an unmanned aircraft system to any person except an unauthorized trader or owner. And with respect to powers of inspection, Draft Rule 14 states that the Director General of Civil Aviation has the powers to inspect a facility called as Unmanned Aircraft System Manufacturing Facility or Maintenance Facility before granting any authorization under these rules. And third party insurance policy had been made compulsory as we can find in Rule 52 which states that no unmanned aircraft system shall operate in India unless there is in existence a valid third party insurance policy. And this is required to cover the liability that may arise because of an accident or a mishap involving unmanned aircraft system. Now it is reported that keeping security and safety in mind, if the rules are once finalized after a period of say one or two months, it will progressively or gradually pave way for using drones for e-commerce. See, though the article title states that the present draft rules prohibit the use of drones for delivery, we should note that powers in this regard is given to Director General of Civil Aviation. There are two rules, rule number 36 and 38. Rule 36 deals with carriage of payload and rule 38 deals with dropping of articles. If one closely observes these two rules, one can understand more powers related to these matters are to be given to Director General of Civil Aviation. For example, rule 36 states that no unmanned aircraft shall carry any payload unless specified by DGCA. And regarding dropping of articles, it states that no person shall drop anything in motion except in a manner and procedure specified by the Director General. So this means it is the Director General who is to specify the manner and procedure in which articles are to be dropped if they are going to be allowed to carry payloads. The rules also categorizes unmanned aircraft system into three types remotely piloted aircraft system, model remotely piloted aircraft system, autonomous unmanned aircraft system. And it also classifies unmanned aircraft as well into five types. And this is based on maximum all up weight including payload of unmanned aircraft. For example, it classifies unmanned aircraft into nano aircraft, micro aircraft, small aircraft, medium and large aircraft. For example, large aircraft is an aircraft for which maximum all up weight is greater than 150 kg. For nano, the maximum all up weight is less than or equal to 250 grams. 
reports are saying that in general nano class drones will be allowed to operate in india however heavier drones will be operated subjected to ensuring qualified remote pilots for the operation of heavier drones so these are some of the important provisions of the draft rules so all these developments give an idea that food delivery by drones or delivery by drones in general in india is not so far and we have been uh, discussing in news analysis and seeing in various news articles about the possibility of delivery of medicines as well the government of telangana is also making steps to deliver medicines into remote and rural areas and recently director general of civil aviation has approved 13 companies logistics and service providing companies to conduct drone testing to deliver food and other necessary amenities other necessary amenities for example like medicines books etc the tests are likely to begin from the first week of july the companies will need to complete at least 100 hours of flight time in the specific air space designated by airport authority of india and this is to be achieved by september 30 they will be submitting their reports to director general of civil aviation who will then examine the feasibility of remote operations of drones and though this draft rules which recently released deals with unmanned aircraft system in general we could expect a separate set of rules dealing with use of drones for e-commerce or to deliver medical supplies which may take at least one year from now keeping safety security qualifications eligibility etc in mind So these are some of the important aspects with reference to the analysis of this news article. Now let us move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is with reference to the Payments Infrastructure Development Fund. See this fund is created by the Reserve Bank of India, the banking regulator in our country. And as we know, the payments ecosystem in our country has evolved over a period of time and now we can see a wide range of options like paying through mobile phones, credit cards, debit cards, etc. and we know that the government is promoting digitization of payment systems and in order to provide further fillip to digitization of payment systems it becomes important to boost the payment acceptance infrastructure across the country in many places the customer will have a debit card or credit card for paying purposes whereas the merchant may not have the infrastructure to accept the payment so here payment acceptance infrastructure it refers to point of sale machines or mobile or portable point of sale terminals so there is a digital divide in india which refers to gap among demographics and regions that have access to modern information and communications technology and those demographics and regions that do not have access to modern ict or those have restricted access to information and communications technology as a result of this there are several underserved and even unserved areas in india when it comes to payment acceptance infrastructure So now coming to this fund that is created by RBI it aims to address this challenge with reference to payment acceptance infrastructure it aims to encourage acquirers to deploy point of sale infrastructure both in digital and also in physical modes and these are to be deployed in tier 3 to tier 6 centers and in northeastern states here the term acquirer it refers to banks who install the POS terminal at the location of the merchant Now for this fund RBI is to make an initial contribution of rupees 250 crores and this will cover 50% of the fund and remaining contribution will be from card issuing banks and card networks that are operating in the country in addition this fund will also receive recurring contributions or continuous contributions to cover operational expenses from card issuing banks and card networks in case rbi finds there is an yearly deficit or shortfall in this fund in that point of time rbi will contribute to this fund and one of the important things about this fund is that it will be governed through an advisory council and this fund is to be managed and administered by reserve bank of india now if you see the significance of this fund we know that merchant acquisition and merchant terminalization of pos infrastructure is costly here merchant acquirer is the bank which has installed pos terminal at the merchant location the costly nature is because of high capital cost of pos machine then recurring maintenance or servicing cost and then difficulty of servicing point of sale machines in rural unserved and underserved areas 
And because of the high cost involved here, most of the point of sale terminals in our country are concentrated in tier 1 and tier 2 cities and towns. So therefore, it is in this juncture, this fund is expected to boost and facilitate and support payment acceptance infrastructure in the underserved areas and in unserved areas. And it aims to significantly increase the merchant base accepting digital payments. With this, we come to the end of analysis of this news article. We saw about this fund. We saw who governs this fund. We saw some features of this fund. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. These news articles talk about the decision of India and China in handling the recent tensions along the line of actual control. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of these news articles are highlighted here for your reference. For past many days, we have been discussing about tensions between India and China along LAC. We are also seeing the ongoing Cold War-like situation between China and USA. We also saw how both nations should respond and solve the border issues at least for time being. And today's news represent the first step on resolving the issues between both countries, which has been agreed through a high-level diplomatic engagement of both the nations. The news is that they have decided to resolve the ongoing issue peacefully. See, a virtual meeting through video conference was held between the Joint Secretary to the East Asia Division of Ministry of External Affairs of India and the Director General in the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In this virtual meeting, the two sides reviewed the state of bilateral relations, including the current developments. And they agreed to follow a consensus that differences should be handled peacefully and they should not become disputes. Surprisingly, the standoffs were termed as differences only, not border disputes. They agreed that peaceful, stable and balanced relations between India and China will be a positive factor for stability in the present global situation. This is one of the reasons why the two sides have decided to handle their differences through peaceful discussion. And such discussion is to be held keeping in mind the importance of respecting each other's sensitivities, concerns and aspirations and not allowing the concerns or differences to escalate into disputes. So it is expected that military level talks will be held between lieutenant generals of both countries in the coming days. According to the news article, Chinese press release mentioned additional points about the talks which were not mentioned in the Indian press release. According to the news article, Chinese press release had said that the two countries agreed opposing the politicization of epidemic situation and to support the World Health Organization. Now we know that such opposition is to benefit China as countries are blaming China for poor handling of virus outbreak, particularly in the early times. And as a result of the poor handling, it has become a global pandemic. Oh, even based on this, USA is accusing China and also World Health Organization saying it has become a puppet of China and lacks independence. Even US has announced to curb all funding to WHO recently. So if politicizing is curbed, then China can escape the international criticism and it will be successful in manipulating the global public opinion in its favor. And this is particularly crucial for China in the context of new Cold War scenario. And Chinese release also added that both sides will resolutely safeguard and promote multilateralism and that they will oppose unilateralism, protectionism and hegemonism. They will jointly safeguard international fairness and justice and safeguard the common interests of developing countries. By these statements, we can observe the terms like unilateralism, protectionism. By these things, China is directly attacking United States. In the past few days, we discussed how multilateralism should be followed in the current scenario and how this presents India an opportunity to bring both US and China into consensus or into a same framework. Even in the recently conducted online NAM summit, Indian Prime Minister expressed that new international order has to be established based on the principles of inclusiveness, humanity, fairness and equality. And yesterday we saw that China is against USA's hegemonism or leadership. So China is creating its own parallel universe for resisting the United States. Here the term parallel universe could refer to building an alternate trading system or building a multilateral banking system against the interests of USA etc. 
and for these things usa is responding through several means even the us president has recently proposed to expand the g7 framework into g11 framework by including four countries india russia south korea and australia we can observe that china is not included so the plan of us is to isolate china in the international arena it is in this juncture china seems to expect that if issues with india are resolved india will support china in the new cold war but we know china is trying to get hold of the indo pacific or at least being a superpower in south china sea but china being a superpower in south china sea is to affect the economic interest and trade routes of united states and in some level it also affects india's interest in the region as well so if india wants to maintain strategic autonomy and decisional autonomy which has been a characteristic feature of indian foreign policy particularly in the pandemic scenario if india maintains strategic autonomy it will be wise to resolve issues diplomatically and to establish multilateralism as a global order and in this multilateralism india will also be a superpower among other powers maybe like a concept of a global triumvirate or a global powers of three with us and china in it so from this discussion on recent decision by india and china you can observe how recent bilateral issues are temporarily resolved by safeguarding the interest of both sides in the context of existing challenges or emerging challenges of china In this scenario one of the news articles mentioned that China has appointed a new army commander to oversee its army's ground force on the India border it assumes importance because there is ongoing tensions across LAC a lieutenant general has been appointed as the new commander of western theater command ground force of china now here what do you mean by the term theater command see a theater command is a military structure where there will be presence of assets of all the three forces army air force and navy in a single defined geographical region this is called as theater so these assets of three forces will be found in a particular theater of war but under the operational control of a theater commander and this theater command concept is also called as geographical integration model or joint command model so here all combat and combat support forces are located in a defined geographical region and they are operationally controlled by a theater commander now here you know that china has five theater commands eastern western southern northern and central theater commands of this the western theater command is responsible for the india border and it is said as the biggest of five theater commands so the new commander of the western theater ground force who is the lieutenant general in china will report to their general who is the commander of the western theater command here this general shao was the western theater commander during the 2017 doklam standoff these two individuals are key figures in decision making regarding standoffs as the responsibility for planning generally lies with the western theater command so these are some of the important points with reference to the analysis of these news articles we discussed about the high level diplomatic engagement between india and china to resolve the temporary differences along the line of actual control then we saw the additional points mentioned in the chinese press release about the high level diplomatic engagement what are the results of it what are the points in which both countries agreed etc then we saw about uh, theater command in brief and finally concluded with the appointment of a new commander for the ground force of western theater command of china now let's move on to next news article This news article states that ahead of vote for UN Security Council seat India launches campaign brochure. We know that India is likely to be elected as the non-permanent member of UN Security Council for 2021-2022 and for this election is to be conducted on June 17. If this materializes India will become the non-permanent member of Security Council for the 8th time. In this context let us discuss about United Nations Security Council and its structure the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference see UN Security Council is one of the six main organs or six principal organs of the United Nations other main organs are UN General Assembly Economic and Social Council the Trusteeship Council the International Court of Justice and the UN Secretariat All the main organs were established in 1945 when the United Nations was founded. Here the headquarters of International Court of Justice is at Netherlands while all other main organs are based at United Nations headquarters in New York. 
Now, under the United Nations Charter, the UN Security Council has primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Under this responsibility, it takes the lead in resolving a threat to the peace or an act of aggression. It calls upon parties to a particular dispute to settle the dispute by peaceful means. And it also recommends methods of adjustment or terms of settlement. In some cases, the Security Council can resort to imposing sanctions on a member country or countries. And when UN Security Council considers that non-military measures are have proven inadequate, it can authorize the use of force to maintain or to restore international peace and security. Now let's discuss about UN Security Council membership. See, it has 15 members, 5 permanent members and 10 non-permanent members. And when it comes to voting, each member has one vote. And uh, under the UN Charter, all member states of UN are obligated to comply with the decisions of UN Security Council. And with respect to five permanent members, as we know, these are USA, UK, France, then China and Russia. And out of the 10 non-permanent members, five are elected every year by the UN General Assembly for a two-year period. And know that the non-permanent members are elected based on geographic representation. Five will be elected from African and Asian states, one from Eastern European states, two from Latin American states, and two from Western European and other states. Now coming to the presidency in the Security Council, it rotates and changes every month. It can be held by both permanent and non-permanent members in the English alphabetical order of their names. Now let's see the voting pattern in the council. See each member of UN Security Council has one vote as we said already. To take decisions on procedural matters of UN Security Council, it shall be made by a positive or affirmative vote of nine members. And this requirement of nine also includes the concurring votes of permanent members as well. And with respect to a particular dispute, a party to that particular dispute shall abstain from voting. And as we know already, five permanent members are given a special voting power called as the right to veto. It means if any one of the five permanent members cast a negative vote in the 15 member security council, then the resolution or decision would not be approved. Even if one country casts a negative vote, the decision cannot be approved. That is the power of permanent members in UN Security Council to decide about the global affairs that can include 190 and above countries. And all the five permanent member countries have exercised their right of veto at some point or another. If a permanent member does not fully agree with the proposed resolution or decision, and if it does not wish to cast a veto, it may choose to abstain. In this case, the resolution could be adopted if it obtains the required number of nine favorable votes. So now coming to the news article, it talks about India's possible election into UN Security Council. And if India becomes a non-permanent member, then it will be having a great opportunity to highlight international terrorism in the council. Then also about reforms required in United Nations and also about expansion of Security Council. This also includes India's rightful claim to UN Security Council permanent membership as well. Then India can play a very effective role in streamlining UN's peacekeeping operations and technology initiatives. And as per the article, Ministry of External Affairs stated that India's objective would be to achieve a new orientation for a reformed multilateral system called as norms. We'll get more editorials in the coming days on these norms that India has proposed for the world. As and when based on relevance, we'll discuss them in our news analysis. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article, it mentions that National Human Rights Commission has directed Superintendent of Police of Chindwara in Madhya Pradesh to take appropriate action related to a human rights violation. The action has to be taken against a human rights violation where a person was thrashed by the police in May 2020. Recently, on 1st of June 2020, we discussed about State Human Rights Commission with reference to a human rights violation in the state of Telangana. Today, let's discuss about National Human Rights Commission, which was also a statutory body. See, NHRC was established in the year 1993. It is established by Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. This act was amended twice. The Protection of Human Rights Amendment Act 2006 and last year, the Protection of Human Rights Amendment Act 2019. So it was established for the protection and promotion of human rights. The functions of the commission are mentioned in section 12 of this legislation. 
and uh, apart from inquiry into complaints of violation of human rights and negligence in the prevention of human rights violation by a public servant the commission also studies treaties international instruments on human rights and it makes recommendations for their effective implementation to the government now you should note that by 2019 amendment the composition of nhrc has been modified at present the commission consists of a chairperson and members here when we say members it includes five members and seven deemed to be members earlier to be appointed as a chairperson the qualification was a person has to be a former chief justice of india but now after the 2019 amendment the eligibility is a former chief justice of india or a former judge of supreme court now with respect to the five members one member is current or former judge of supreme court then another member is current or former chief justice of a high court then three members are to be appointed from amongst persons having knowledge or practical experience in matters relating to human rights and out of these three members who are experts at least one member should be a woman previously it was two members and there was no reservation for women this was the case before the 2019 amendment now because of the 2019 amendment the chairperson of national commission for backward classes the chairperson of national commission for protection of child rights and the chief commissioner for persons with disabilities also to be deemed to be members of the commission now note that chairperson and members of nhrc they are appointed by the president even yesterday we saw about attorney general as per article 76 of indian constitution who is also appointed by the president however coming to nhrc here the chairperson members they are appointed by the president after obtaining recommendations of a committee that consists of prime minister as the chairperson and these members in it we should note that before 2019 amendment the term of office of chairperson and members was 5 years however at present it was reduced to 3 years by the amendment the amendment has also made the chairperson to be eligible for reappointment as well earlier members only were eligible for reappointment there was no provision about reappointment in regards with the chairperson and as we know after ceasing to hold office as chairperson or as a member of nhrc they are ineligible for further employment under the government of india or under the government of any state this provision is there to ensure that the members and chairperson they act with fairness and in an impartial manner so these are some of the important points with respect to nhrc overall we can say that with respect to appointment of chairperson of nhrc the recent amendment has widened the choices of the government so that it can even appoint any retired judge of the supreme court also as a chairperson in this discussion we saw about nhrc the composition particularly as altered by the 2019 amendment and the term of office as altered by the amendment the functions have been given for your reference now let's move on to next news article this news article is with reference to tiananmen square massacre of beijing in china june 4 2020 was observed or remembered as the 30th anniversary of the tiananmen square massacre every year united states issues a statement that demands china to be held accountable for this massacre that happened 30 years ago us calls on china to honor the memory of those individuals who lost their lives and it puts pressure on china to provide full and complete accounting of those who were killed who were detained or who remain missing in connection with the events surrounding the massacre See this massacre took place on June 4 1989. It happened when students in China gathered in Tiananmen Square in Beijing to mark the death of popular pro-reform Chinese leader Hu Yaoban. The demonstration also became a forum to protest corruption, inflation and the demonstration also called for broader political and economic reforms. Chinese society from workers to ordinary citizens from everywhere joined this protest and reportedly around 10 lakh people were participating in the demonstrations amidst the demonstration it is reported that the people's liberation army of china stormed the tiananmen square with tanks and it crushed the protest in the operation of the army thousands of people were killed and this is what is referred to massacre but chinese government has never acknowledged the true events surrounding this massacre it remains a contentious topic in china with authorities banning all mention about that protest even today this is because open discussion of brutal suppression is banned in mainland china 
After the massacre or after the crackdown, after some weeks, the Beijing city government claimed that only around 200 people had died and majority among them were soldiers and with only 36 students killed. In fact, there are also reports that say the central government of China has never released a complete official tone. It is in this juncture that U.S. puts pressure to provide a full accounting of those who were killed, detained or remain missing in connection with the events surrounding the Tiananmen Square massacre which took place on June 4, 1989. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. Now let's see a few practice questions. See this question which is with reference to National Human Rights Commission. The question reads with reference to National Human Rights Commission which of the following statements are correct. Three statements are given. First statement, the incumbent Chief Justice of India or Judge of Supreme Court is eligible to be appointed as its chairperson. So this statement is incorrect as only former CJA or former Judge of Supreme Court is eligible. So you can eliminate options A and B as they say statement 1 is correct. Now we can just check whether statement 3 is correct or not to directly arrive at the correct answer. See statement 3 on ceasing to hold office, chairperson or a member is ineligible for further employment under government of India. This statement is correct because to ensure independence, to ensure fairness and impartisanship in their work, to work without fear and favor to the government, they are ineligible for further employment under government of India. Statement 3 is correct. So the correct answer is option C. Now coming to the second statement, the chairperson and members are ineligible for reappointment. Now this statement is incorrect because both of them are eligible for reappointment. Particularly the recent 2019 amendment has made it clear that the chairperson is also eligible for reappointment while the members were even earlier eligible for reappointment. So the correct answer for this question is option C. Now this question is with reference to Payments Infrastructure Development Fund. Two statements are given. Which of the statements are correct? First statement, it aims to encourage acquirers to deploy point of sale infrastructure, both physical and digital modes, in tier 3 to tier 6 centers and northeastern states. This statement is correct and it is in brief about this development fund and its objective and where it is to work. The second statement is also correct and note that as per the press release of RBI, this fund will be governed by an advisory council and managed and administered by RBI. So the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Now this question is with reference to Tiananmen Square Massacre. The question reads, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, sometimes seen in the news, is related to which of the following countries? The correct answer is option B, China. This question is with reference to United Nations Security Council. Three statements are given. Which of the statements given above are correct? First statement, it is one of the main organs of United Nations. This statement is correct, so you can eliminate option D. Now, second statement, United Nations Security Council can resort to authorize the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. This statement is also correct. Whenever it feels peaceful means are inadequate to maintain or to restore international peace and security, it can resort to authorize the use of force. So second statement is also correct. So you can eliminate option C, which does not say that the second statement is correct. Now see, we have confirmed that the first two statements are correct. No options are saying all the three statements are correct. Therefore, the correct answer is option B, 1 and 2 only. Now come to the third statement. A country can become the non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for only two terms. This statement is incorrect. In fact, India has become non-permanent member so far for seven times and it is to become for the eighth time in the coming year if it is to get elected, which is of high probability on June 17, 2020. So the correct answer here is 1 and 2 only. With this, we come to the end of today's the Hindu News Analysis. If you like the video, if you would have enjoyed the content, don't fail to click the like button and share this resource among your friends and those who are in need of such resources. And subscribe to the Shankarayas Academy YouTube channel to get notified about new updates.